Hello, everyone. I uh, just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to Connie, to Kristen, uh, and the larger Interfaith Alliance. I uh, always appreciate the opportunity um, to speak uh, with this group. Uh, we're a wonderful group of passionate, active, very well-educated individuals. And um, uh, it, it's always nice to, to speak to a group of uh, primarily friendly faces, <laughs> especially if we are approaching this very uh, tumultuous session, to say the least. Um, I, I don't think I have to spend too much time talking about it, but obviously things did not go in a direction um, that we believe are going to be friendly um, to uh, public education uh, or to labor organizations um, in this past election cycle. Uh, with the loss of the Democratic majority in the Iowa State Senate, we no longer have a pro-public education or pro-labor uh, goalie or backstop of the capital. Um, and that means that there is no longer a gatekeeper for some really potentially devastating pieces of legislation. Um, but I'm not going to be too negative, hopefully, in this conversation. Um, but I do want to uh, take a moment to discuss some of the uh, pieces of legislation that we believe we're going to be seeing uh, when the legislature kicks off on January 9th. Um, and just kind of give you a little bit of uh, an idea of the lay of the land up there. On your table, um, there's only one per table, I apologize for that, but um, this is a document we produced at the Iowa State Education Association uh, based off of the past General Assembly, so the 86th General Assembly, uh, which would have been 2015, 2016. Um, and because we do not possess a crystal ball, um, and don't read tea leaves at the Iowa State Education Association, we kind of have to um, go by what we've seen proposed, uh, primarily by the House Republicans in the last few years, to give us a roadmap of where we think they might try to go in the upcoming legislative session during the 87th General Assembly. And so this is an example of some of the pieces of legislation um, that were proposed when we did have a pro-public uh, education and pro-labor um, uh, leader in the Iowa State Senate. Um, in particular, I would draw your attention um, to a couple of bills. Uh, the first is in that top right-hand corner, House File 549-115. These were two bills that attempted to um, go in and dismantle our collective bargaining rights, which are contained in Chapter 20 uh, here in the state of Iowa. And that's very important to the Iowa State Education Association because we are a union of more than 34,000 education professionals across the state. And for us, um, we are heavily invested in protecting educational opportunities for all students um, from early childhood education up through higher education, as we represent folks who work both in preschools um, all the way up through community colleges, for example. Uh, and so we really run that whole gamut and care about education policy um, as well as collective bargaining rights. Um, and so we know that there are going to be attacks on our ability uh, to collective bar collectively bargain. Uh, the question is, are they going to come after us, frankly, with a sledgehammer, like they did, for example, in Wisconsin, um, or are they going to go after us with a scalpel or a, a chisel? Is it going to be a situation where they just take away our rights to collectively bargain right out the gate? Um, or are they going to try to uh, eliminate certain subjects of mandatory uh, or mandatory topics of bargaining, for example, going after health insurance? Um, and those kinds of things. And um, we don't know yet, uh, but we do know um, that having the ability to sit down and negotiate with management a fair contract is a process that's worked for us for a very, very long time. Um, and so we hope whatever legislation is proposed in that vein is not a solution in search of a problem, but rather is something that would actually work to benefit um, both sides of those equations. Um, it's something that also keeps students at the center of the conversation. We need to remember that in particular, public educators, this is not a profession that people get into to get rich, right? This is a profession that people do because they feel empowered to do, because they feel like they have an opportunity to provide a public service. Uh, and so what can we do to make sure that education professionals are respected uh, in this profession, that they are protected, so that they feel that they have the freedom to do the jobs that they were hired to do? Um, in that vein, uh, we need to also look at potential infringements upon public education policy. And a lot of that has to do with money and what resources might be available to us. Something else that is highlighted um, on this flyer in the upper um, right hand, now that I turned it around, corner, 
has to do with the supplemental state aid rate, formerly known as allowable growth. And that would be the percentage of growth um, that is supposed to be determined by the legislature to indicate uh, the per pupil funding amount um, that we have for students that pays or helps to pay for everything from keeping the lights on in the building to paying your, your staff and your faculty. And we know that over the course of the last six years, um, the legislature has been in violation of not setting this along the uh, uh, legislatively determined timeline, and that the amount they've set it at has been woefully inadequate. Uh, with inflationary costs running approximately 3%, um, we need to have investments of at least 3%, if not more, to be able to just keep up with the cost of doing business. And that has not been the case over the last several years. And unfortunately, uh, perhaps you've seen in the news the last couple of days, uh, Governor Branstad has been mentioning to some people he hopes he can propose a budget that would have 2% supplemental state aid for the next two years. He hopes. That's what he's going to try for. But I would remind you that the House Republicans, in particular over the last two years, um, have attempted to come in with their budgets under Branstad's budgets. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, 2% is going to be highly unlikely. Um, I do think, unlike years past, that we might actually find ourselves with a rate of SSA set very quickly, because they're not going to want to belabor the point. So I think they're going to give us a really low number, just right out the gate and be done with it. In doing that, they'll be able to move on quicker to other education proposals um, that are not going to be very, very favorable to the public education system in general. And um, we don't have a ton of time here, um, so I would look forward to additional questions on more, you know, kind of specific issues. But one thing I will mention before um, I give the microphone to Aaron would be the idea of educational savings accounts, which is a piece of legislation that's been introduced over the last couple of years um, that would essentially take the poor people uh, funding amount. Um, let's say, hypothetically, just an estimate, $6,500 per student, and it would give that same per people funding amount to both private school students as well as homeschool students. The price tag for that um, is, is quite significant. Uh, depending upon the number of students you're calculating, let's assume there are 50,000 students who are attending a private school right now which, by the way, are not receiving their per people funding amount for, and that we haven't been calculating for, by the way, in our finance formula. Let's say that there's also an additional between 10 and 15,000 homeschool students. Now, keep in mind, we don't know the exact number, because unfortunately, we stopped regulating that or keeping track of that uh, as a uh, education reform proposal compromise a couple of years ago. So let's say, conservative estimate, there are 65,000 new students who would be eligible for $6,500 per people um, uh, credit or savings, uh, amount of money that could be put into a savings account specifically for education costs. Um, the calculations on that is going to be somewhere upwards of $200 million. But we know that this is a priority of a lot of people who are now in a majority position in the legislature. So in years past, um, ISEA as well as many of our allied organizations have supported no less than 4% supplemental state aid, which has a price tag of approximately $200 million. In the last several years, they've told us, oh no, it's too expensive, we can't afford to do that. It'll be interesting to see how quickly they're able to come up with the money <clears throat> to instead of spend $200 million that would benefit a system, a public school system that provides education to over 480,000 students, how quickly they can come up with $200 million to only benefit approximately 60, 65,000 students um, at a time when uh, we have a finite number of resources, and, and frankly, the Iowa State Education Association, as well as our allied organizations, believe those resources need to go to advantage the most children, you know, as many children as possible, um, and protect equal access to a quality education. We don't have a problem, please. If you feel necessary, send your children to private school, but if you're going to use state resources to do it, we need to make investments so that all kids have access to a quality program. Thank you.